Jake here. Thank you for taking a trip to the past with me. The original podcast version of The Americans will be released weekly, but if you don't want to wait, then go to jakebible.substack.com and become a paid subscriber. You'll receive access to all of The Americans as well as early release novels, audiobooks, and other exclusive extras. That's jakebible.substack.com. Now enjoy the original podcast production of The Americans. Cheers. Warning. This podcast reading is for mature audiences only. You will not be warned again. Welcome to the podcast reading of Jake Bible's The Americans, book two in the Dead Mech Apex Trilogy. The Americans is a side quill to Dead Mech, meaning it takes place simultaneously with Book 1. You can listen to this novel first, or start with Dead Mech. Go to jakebible.com for more information on this podcast, Dead Mech, and other fiction by Jake Bible. Enjoy. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Americans. I know it's been a while. I've been on hiatus for a bit. Life gets in the way sometimes. You know, just how that is. Um, yeah, basically I didn't have a recording set up for a couple months, so now I do. Isn't this exciting? I'm glad you guys stuck with me for that, um, you know, it was only two months. That's that's shorter than when TV seasons go on hiatus, so I, I hope everybody was able to hold it together and not freak out. Anyway, welcome back. Um, I've been busy, busy, busy doing all the edits on um, the American's manuscript. It will be out by Halloween, so be on the lookout for announcements there. And once I say so, just, hey, spread that word. Let's get the Americans sold out there. That would be outstanding. Having Dead Mech out there and then the side cool of the Americans, that's great. Hopefully, um, it'll really catch on. That would be outstanding. Um... What else is there really to say, you know? <laughs> there isn't a whole lot. Um, I, I'm, <sighs> life's just been unbelievably busy. Uh, there just hasn't been any time for recording, hasn't been any time for editing, barely any time for writing, um, but I've had to kind of push through and, and get that going. Um, I think really, you know, all there is to say, oh, I know, hey, 31 days of Halloween. If you haven't purchased it yet, you should get it, because guess what? Halloween's coming up, people. It's the perfect time. Right now is the time when you want to read this. You can go to my website, jakebible.com. There's links there. Or, heck, just go to Amazon, 31 Days of Halloween. Look it up. You can go to Barnes & Noble, 31 Days of Halloween. Look it up. Smashwords, 31 Days of Halloween. Look it up. Woo! Um, I think that's, you know, that's where I'll, where it's all at. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, I hope you guys, you know, well... I hope you guys have all been well. I do. I really wish you well. And I'm glad you're back. I'm glad I'm back. We've only got about, what, nine more episodes to go, I believe, until it's all finito benito. So that's kind of cool. Um, just about all wrapped up. You got to like that. You really got to like that. Um, yeah. I really think that's it, you know? <laughs> Not a whole lot has changed since um, you last heard from me. Other than I've just been busy as shit, people. Busy as shit. So I'm going to stop rambling because I really don't have a whole lot to say right now. And just get right into the story and hope you enjoy it. Um, you know, feel free to give me a shout on Twitter. Feel free to check out the Facebook fan page, Jake Bible's Wasteland. And as I have more to announce, which I will, I'll do that in the next, um, you know, intros to the next couple episodes. And yeah, that's about it. Okay. I'm done rambling. Done. Cutting myself off right now. Cutting off. Done. All right. Cheers, y'all. Enjoy. Chapter 26 Zverev's undead body battered at the sealed door. The screams from the terrified occupants echoing inside the house further enraged the creature, making it double its effort to gain entrance. Other screams echoed about the chaotic street as people tried to flee the horror that had befallen the ravaged city of St. Petersburg. Some tried to fight, but were quickly overcome, their bodies torn apart and feasted upon by the undead attackers. Blood filled the gutters, and guts, limbs, and heads littered the ground, long since grown cold and of no interest to the creatures. 
Five more of the undead joined Zverev, and their combined force ripped the door from its frame. Gunshots erupted from the dark house, but they couldn't stop the bloodlust that fueled the creatures. Zverev roared and knocked the rifle from the woman that held it, tossing the useless weapon to the ground. She tried to escape, but he was on her so fast she hadn't fully turned away when he sank his teeth into the side of her neck and yanked back, nearly ripping her head right off. Blood sprayed the room and the other creatures went wild, lapping at the hot red liquid. Several tried to get at the corpse, but Zverev fought them off, keeping the flesh for himself. Once the body cooled, Zverev rose and stalked from the house, ready to find more people, more victims, more flesh. Within minutes, the woman's body reanimated, its wounds knitting back together, and she stomped up the stairs to the bedrooms above, some echo in the creature's brain knowing exactly where the rest of the family hid. So you are saying that this nanotech that is inside Miss Walton, Mr. Brenton, and Prince Tartaroff has somehow combined with the virus that creates, well, for lack of a better word, zombies? General Millman asked. Precisely, General, Beth replied. And not just that, but the three have modified the nanotech further, taking elements of biochrome and fusing it with the archaic metals of the UDC, giving the nanobots the ability to morph and reconfigure the host body at their will, or at the virus's will basically allowing the infected to heal instantly, whether dead or alive. Then they're virtually unstoppable, Colonel Owens exclaimed. How do we counter that? Ghosts, Bess said flatly. Ghosts can manipulate any and all BC. But they have to come into contact with it, Colonel Smithfield stated. That would leave them wide open to infection. True, General Millman agreed, which is why there would need to be teams. Some ghosts could be on point and incapacitate the zombies, while others would wait in the wings to help heal any ghosts infected. Exactly, Beth nodded. Once healed, the ghost's nanotech would be frozen into a permanent state, ending any programming control the viral modifications may have had. Could they still retain the instant healing abilities? Colonel Smithfield asked. Well, possible. It would depend on the skill of the ghost tasked to do the healing, Beth replied. I would say each outcome may be slightly different, but it could be worked out. The two colonels looked at each other and grinned. You two had better not be thinking of pre-infecting ghosts, the general warned. However, his protest was weak since the value of such an action was outweighing his misgivings. That is possible also, Beth answered, an inoculation of sorts. This is a lot to think about, Miss Laughlin, the general said, rising and offering his hand. I suggest you get some sleep. I'll have our techs go over the data and see if we can come up with anything else. They'll also be studying the results from the tests on Miss Walton, Mr. Brenton, and His Highness. Beth rose and shook each man's hand. Before I go, have you considered how we will handle the nanotech that is running rampant in North America? That won't respond to ghost manipulation. It's something we'll have to tackle before we get there, but not right now. One crisis at a time, the general answered. Fair enough. Good night, gentlemen. <laughs> Beth slowly made her way to her quarters and was surprised when she found Billy fast asleep in one of the bunks. Melissa stirred and sat up on one arm. Don't wake him, Melissa whispered. He was a bitch to get to sleep. Wouldn't shut up about how much it hurt getting poked and prodded. Beth grinned. Where's Heather? She's with Al, Melissa grinned. Not having memory of their breakup has turned Prince Pain in the ass into Prince Charming. I don't know a lot about relationships, Beth said quietly as she pulled off her boots and removed her pants, slipping into the small but cozy bunk waiting for her. But even I could tell those two weren't quite done. Tell me about it, Melissa agreed. The sexual tension was a bit thick. Melissa hesitated. You want to tell me what you meant by being only four years old? Not tonight, Mel, Beth yawned. I just don't have it in me. It was nice of Billy to volunteer to switch rooms, Heather said, her head on Alex's chest. The sheets were a mess, barely covering their naked bodies as they lay on the small bunk, limbs intertwined. He didn't volunteer, Alex replied, his hand moving from her hair down to the soft skin of her shoulder, her back, her hip, and back up again. I made a strong suggestion. Well, thank you for that strong suggestion, Heather said, lifting her head up and kissing his lips, then neck, before settling her cheek on his chest once again. My body needed this. Nothing like good sex to get back in shape after spending most of the day as an undead monster, Alex laughed. 
Not funny, Heather said, reaching up and tweaking a nipple. Ow! Alex protested weakly, reaching for Heather's nipple. Don't even try it, she warned, slapping his hand away. They lay quiet for a moment, and Alex had thought Heather had drifted to sleep when she asked, Did we really break up? Yes, and it was not pretty. I could just imagine, she sighed, settling her body closer into his. My fault or yours? What do you think? Mutual? Of course. God forbid one of us lets the other get the upper hand. But we never actually got divorced. Nope. And neither of us pushed the issue. We just quit and walked away. I think we were both in shock after what happened to Mel's folks. I guess we knew we couldn't really let each other go. I know I couldn't, Alex sighed. And I'm glad I didn't, Princess. Heather pushed upright and looked deeply into Alex's eyes. That's right, I'm still officially a Russian princess. That you are, with all the rights and privileges, such as these fine accommodations. Alex swept his hand about, indicating the bunk room that was barely nine meters square. As long as there's a bed, it's fine by me, Heather purred, shifting and straddling Alex's waist. They held each other's gaze for a moment, then kissed deeply, their bodies pressed as close together as possible, trying to become one. Once regal attire, then blood cake tatters, dragged behind the shuffling undead empress as she made her way through the ravaged winter palace. Her body hunched as she shambled, her head turning at every noise, the predator seeking more food, more flesh to devour. She had already mutilated half of her personal staff, most of them rushing to help her, thinking she had been injured, not knowing she was death walking. Those that she didn't savage into immobility shambled along behind her as they had before their deaths, their usual sycophantic mumblings replaced by hungry grunts and growls. Somewhere in their rotting brains there must have been the vestiges of their training as they continued to defer to the zombie empress when living flesh was found, allowing her to feast to her fill before they pounced on the body, hoping it was still warm and to their taste. Within hours, all that hid were found— all that ran were tracked down, all that lived died, and soon after rose, joining the rest of the undead creatures that wandered through the many halls of the palace. Zverev's undead eyes didn't blink against the blinding rays of the dawn sun as it broke over the buildings of St. Petersburg, illuminating the awful filled streets and streams of blood flowing towards the sewer grates. Far off, at the edge of the city, Gunfire erupted, and Zverev turned towards the noise, even though it wasn't the sound of food, his brain so hardwired from decades of intense military training that compulsion led him in that direction. After miles of shambling, and the sun bright in the sky, warming his dead flesh and the dead flesh of the other zombies that had joined him as he made his way through the brutalized city streets, Zverev met the first wave of the three's shock troops. Their bullets ripped through his body, shredding him and others about him until the viral nanotech could no longer repair their forms any longer. The shock troops methodically moved from incapacitated zombie to incapacitated zombie, placing one final headshot into each of their brains, ending their existence forever. The nanotech finally drained of energy. Zverev's dead eyes looked up at the shock trooper standing over him, and he tried to move his jaw to snap at the trooper, but he no longer held the energy to do even that. The trooper pulled the trigger, and Zverev's eyes fixed in place, their search for flesh over. Troopers followed behind the executioners, laying down walls of blue flame, torching the corpses and the nanotech within, turning all into ash that floated lazily in the wake of the forces moving deeper into the city, and then onto the Russian landscape beyond. Mr. Stone stared out the front windshield of the HAV as it approached St. Petersburg, his eyes emotionless, but his homicidal tendencies barely kept in check. He longed for the chance to test his new abilities, to wage war without fear of death, to crush and kill without worrying about any bureaucratic repercussions. His hands clenched and unclenched subconsciously, and the HAV driver glanced nervously at him on occasion. "'You're fidgeting, Mr. Stone,' Reginald said. "'Relax.' Relaxation time has long since passed, Reginald, Mr. Stone responded. The HAV driver glanced over at him, but turned away quickly when he saw the violence in Stone's eyes. Just a suggestion. Wish I could be there with you. You are, Reg. You are. First wave has reported the city clear, 
the trooper said over the comm. Excellent, Mr. Stone responded. Let's move on. Leave one company here for spot checks. ETA until we hit the Chinese border. Twelve hours at full HAV speed, sir, the trooper responded. Then no delays, Stone ordered. We push through everything. If we have to level areas to make sure they are cleansed, then we do so. I don't want anything slowing us down. The Jacks have air capabilities, and they will use them soon. We need to be as far along as possible before we engage. Understood, sir. You've been listening to the podcast reading of Jake Bible's The Americans. This novel and recording are protected under whatever latest, greatest Creative Commons license is out there currently. Share this all you want. Just don't even try to make a buck off it without the express permission of the author, me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, please go to jakebible.com. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this episode of the re-release of the original podcast production of The Americans. Don't want to wait each week for a new episode? Go to jakebible.substack.com and become a paid subscriber. Want more audiobooks? Go to jakebible.com for info and access to dozens of Jake Bible fiction audiobooks and ebooks. Cheers.